Hello again, and welcome to the Master's Voice. I am Celestial, and you are welcome to this channel. To old and new subscribers alike, you are very welcome. If you're not following the Master's Voice, you've got many options. Just look in the description box below. That's just below the video where you can see the channel masthead or the channel photo. Just drop down that menu and you'll be able to see so many platforms, audio and visual, where you can follow and stay up to date as I'm bringing forth the prophetic messages of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is a message that I received just yesterday. Today is November the 26th, 2023. I got this message before I fell asleep. So around 1 a.m. before I went to bed yesterday, November the 25th, 2023. And then when I woke up, that being Saturday, the Lord then gave me messages from about 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, as I was recording the dream that he gave me, writing down the meaning that he gave me, the Lord told me things before I slept and after I woke up, what is coming. So before I went to bed, the first thing that the Lord said between 1 and 2 a.m. was that arrest warrants are coming down the pipeline that will surprise everyone. And he said this very strongly. The Lord is the greatest proponent of justice that there is. Basically, it means that nobody loves justice more than Jesus Christ. Nobody loves right doing more than Jesus Christ. Nobody is more vested in the fact that when evil is done in secret, it must come out in public. Nobody else wants to see perpetrators and evildoers exposed and punished more than the Lord. This means, if you're listening to this prophecy, if you're listening to this broadcast, whether you're listening to, to it in audio or you're watching me now by video, it means that you must key into one very big fact. Jesus is more just and Jesus is more righteous than people give him credit for. That's right. Human beings with all their failings, with all their faults, with all their fallenness, somehow keep getting it confused and thinking that they have the right to judge the Lord God, to judge the Lord Jesus Christ, to judge the Holy Spirit, and to count them unrighteous. This means less righteous than fallen man by constantly complaining about how long it takes God to judge sin, constantly complaining about why doesn't God catch the perpetrators and why is so-and-so getting away with it and why is there so much dirt in the church. And what people don't understand is that God has his timing that has nothing to do with anyone else's opinion. God has his timing and he's not dependent on us as to how and when he will execute it. But the way that people impute unrighteousness to God, to impute unrighteousness to God means to literally look at him and attempt in your fallen ant state to critique him and share your views on who you think he is and whether he's fair or not, because this happened and it was never exposed and that happened and nobody cared. Understand that you live in a fallen world that is filled with fallen people that commit heinous crimes and acts against one another, ex God. This means having nothing to do with God. God has nothing to do with the darkness or the fallenness of the human heart. That's all people giving in to the urges of the one who deceived all mankind in the garden. Again, that sin happened without God's involvement. That was by choice. And every sin after that has been by someone's choice. God has timing to judge sin. God is just, God sees all things. And so as he was bringing this message, I was half passing out with sleep but even I was able to perceive how strongly he was giving me this message, telling me celestial arrests are coming down the pipeline that are going to surprise everyone. And it's going to be the big names. He was saying big names will go down. Big names are going to show up in the press. They will be in the news in areas of government money. This is finance, entertainment, and much more. People will be made to answer for their crimes officially not just in the public realm. So the Lord is saying that finally what hearts have been yearning for, what people have been clamoring for, usually complaining for, is going to start happening. Instead of it being the stooges, instead of it being the cat's paws, instead of it being the middle managers and the guys near the bottom, God says that instead of this just being 
Scandals where people say tonight, investigating the head of so-and-so tonight, new data comes in about the head of so-and-so it's actually going to be that they will go down, which means instead of just headlines that announce what they have done, and then we see them running away with their jackets over their head, or they're walking proudly into court with 16 lawyers because they know they're going to get away with it. The Lord is saying that the time is coming where they will go into the courtroom and they will come out with shock outcomes. They will come out with convictions. They won't just get away with being publicly embarrassed or fines. He says that they will be made to answer for crimes officially and not just in the public realm, meaning that we're not just going to see spattered news, news headlines and talk about it. And this would be a good time to mention the news headlines that dropped. I think it was just a week ago in the entertainment sector concerning one of the, one of the world's biggest entertainment producers and moguls who has called himself everything from Papa Smurf to love, to Diddy, to Puff Daddy. The man's name is Sean Combs and he is currently in the press being accused of heinous crimes that I'm not going to take the time to read in detail. And the reason I won't take the time to read his crimes in detail is because I was speaking of his crimes a year and a half ago by the spirit of the Lord. The prophecy is called the dirt of Hollywood part two, the sodomy ritual part two, a very difficult series of prophecies in which the Lord was showing me what they do in Hollywood and the entertainment music spaces. Some of the things that the Lord mentioned to me, which Christians who had a lot to say at that time felt wasn't necessary for the church to know. Why does the church need to know this? God would not be talking about anyone's private business, except that God is more just than the people who think they know everything because God knows that people are suffering behind their off the shoulder gowns and their $20 million mansions. God knows. And God told me, and I brought it out publicly that women are traded among multiple men in the entertainment world. This is what the Lord says that in order to be a starlet, a woman who makes it to the top, whether in movies or music or other projects, you will be traded among men. And some of the names he mentioned were Beyonce, Jennifer Lawrence, and Cassie. And the exact words in the prophecy were, Cassie has suffered a lot. This is after detailing all the things they do to them that they call them to rituals and they swap them among men, that they pass them around exactly the way prostitutes in a brothel have no say over who they will sleep with or what will happen to them during the process of that forced sexual encounter. And what I said was, as I was going through those very difficult prophecies to all the naysayers who feel that God only wants to talk about um, what they want him to talk about. What I was saying is that it is laughable to think that the judge of the whole earth who sits up there and sees everything can be censured by mere human beings. You think that you can tell God what to talk about, or you think that you can prove yourself wiser than him by questioning, well, why would he want to talk about this? God wants to talk about it because it's evil. There's no such thing as evil off limits because it's evil with famous people. God wanted to talk to it, talk about it, to prove that he knows about it, to prove that he actually cares about it. And I said that the irony is this, when the Holy Spirit reveals these things by the spirit of prophecy, men push it away and reject it because they're proud and arrogant. But when it comes out in the New York Times, then everybody's mouth is open and everybody gets to pretend that it's the first time they're hearing it. And it was no mistake that the publication that broke this abuse was the New York Times, because this is the arrogance of man. When God tells you something, you can't hear it because why would God? But when the New York Times tells you something, then the publication just flies off the shelves because this is the mindset of people today, even Christians, the secular, the secular world should lead the charge in truth. This is the accepted format. 
If the secular world tells you that a tech mogul is corrupt, if the secular world tells you that someone is GMO poisoning the food, if the secular world tells you and confronts you with the fact that the entertainers that you love and revere and worship and look up to live just as low as dogs and barnyard animals that are bred animal to animal with no choice as to who they breed with, if the secular world tells you that, then you're on board. But when the Holy Spirit touches on the sordid mess of people's lives in the darkness, then so many people had something to say. And here we are, one and a half years later, a young woman plucking up her courage at last to speak of her abuse in such a wise way that now it's forever on the court records. Now it's forever captured in a medium that is publicly available online. And any 10-year-old can go and read it if they want. That's what God is going to do. It's no longer going to be the court of Twitter and the court of Facebook. It's no longer going to be rumors. The things that you have heard on this blog are going to be featuring in the top headlines. And then since you didn't want to listen to God when he was talking about it, then you can go read it from the news like seconds because that's the level of your faith. God will prove the people who doubt his word, even in small details about people that I do not know personally. He will prove you wrong. Those who think that the world should lead the charge in truth, you are wrong. It will always be Jesus Christ who leads the charge in truth. And he says that the wicked are going to be exposed. They will have to answer for their crimes. They're no longer going to be tried In the court of public opinion, that's what it means, the public realm. The public realm doesn't harm the wicked. They're sitting in billion dollar mansions. They're flying around in jets. They don't fly coach or even commercial. They can't hear your $2 opinion on whether they're guilty or not. They have to be humbled to the level of the ordinary man. They have to be made to go through the court process just like everybody else. And the father is saying that they will. And he's saying that even the church will not be spared the scandal. This time, instead of confessions from pulpits, instead of empty emotional appeals to be forgiven so that the perpetrator stays relevant, the Lord says that pastors and other church leaders who commit crimes or who have their old crimes uncovered by witnesses and victims will be criminally charged. It will no longer be a church matter that will be settled privately with apologies, with community time off, or with money. I apologize. I had a moral failure. I was weak, but I have considered my actions. Jesus has forgiven me, and now I ask you to forgive me too the end. That's how it used to be. So I'm in my bed and I'm fighting sleep and the Lord is speaking to me. And the words that are coming to my heart are the exact fake words that we always see in the church scandals. I'm sorry. I had a moral failure. Imagine America can't even confess that I sinned. A pastor who preaches or should preach sin in a sermon cannot use the word sin when he sins against others, when he gets involved with the male deacons or the female deaconesses, when he steps out on his wife, when he becomes caught up with drugs, like some pastors do, he can't confess and say, I confess my sin, Psalm 32. My bones were withering away and I grew old, dried up when I would not confess my sin. Sin is the dirty word and yet it's the dirty word that dirties the church that finds different terms for sin. I'm struggling. Oh, I have a weakness. And here, the word that pastors have popularized, or the phrase, should I say, moral failure. Here's the Lord giving the perfect backdrop of what people always say. I apologize. I have moral failure. I was weak, but I've had time to consider my actions. Jesus has forgiven me. They're always quick to throw that in there because that's the psychological warfare against the church. 
That's the manipulation to get the church to come on board quickly so that future questions, further questions cannot be asked, so that investigations cannot be raised. If pastor says that Jesus has forgiven him, then who are you to doubt the truth of his confession? Who are you to hold him hostage with your unforgiveness, your questions? If he says Jesus has forgiven him, you have no choice but to forgive him too, even if he is unrepentant. But God says that scandal is going to hit the church. And I've been saying this for years. You can go back and watch all the prophecies that are involved, involved with the church. God says that pastors will not be spared. Their dirt will be exposed too. So the old format was sin, not have moral failure, but sin and then creep into the pulpit, either to try and get ahead of the scandal before it hits the news, or creep into the scandal once it hits the news, once it gets out, look like a hit dog, and then say that you're having a confession from the pulpit. And many Christians don't understand that the pulpit is a very important place. The pulpit is a place of power. The pulpit is a place of authority. The pulpit has a natural effect on us. It's high, it's raised, it's above us. And well, it should be because that's where God's appointed fivefold ministers stand. That is where we stand in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are called, as we are anointed to carry this word in what's supposed to be wholly set apart vessels, vessels that have been tried and tested, vessels that have made sacrifices. You never stop making sacrifices as a five-fold minister. It never stops being required of you to keep washing your robe, to keep checking yourself, to keep having people who will also check you, to tell you your heart is going a little gray, a little green, a little crusty. It never stops being required of us. So when we step into that place, that place of authority, we are under an anointing. We are under a calling. There is a responsibility of how we are stepping in there. And when people have been properly tra trained, I'm not speaking of this current generation of Christians. I'm just speaking abstractly of the people who knew. Most of them are old. They're 65 and over. People who have been properly trained in understanding how the body of Christ actually works. Principles of discipleship, principles of discipline, principles of honor, those things, those things are either dead, dying, on their way out. So I'm not talking of this current generation. That place is raised because it's a place of authority. So when the pastor goes up there, psychologically, no matter what he's done, no matter what you're starting to see on the blogs, no matter what's flying around in the gossip space, when he goes up there, there's a part of your heart that is honoring God by acknowledging him as still pastor. But then what's the quality of what he's bringing up there? If the pulpit is a place of natural honor and spiritual power, then what is the recourse of the church when a pretender goes up there? Someone who has not repented, but is not above using his position of authority to bulldoze forgiveness out of the sheep. And let's not forget the narcissists, the ones who have not repented, but will not use brute force and will not use tw some twisted scripture message to force forgiveness and to turn the eyes of the sheep from his wrongdoing and put it on the failings of the world. The world is fallen. I fell too. I'm right in sync with the times. And now let's go to the book of Haggai and hide there for a while. What about the narcissists who come out and preach to the people about their own sin for two and a half hours so that they feel they have no moral standing to doubt him or to look cross-eyed at him for what's on the little gossip spaces and things like that? The pulpit can be abused. It is being heavily abused. And that's why God says confessions from pulpits are not it and they are not going to stand. You know what? You're gonna be in the middle of that confession and the FBI are gonna walk in and embarrass you and your church goers are going to forget about all that pastor business and those phones are going to come out exactly as I said. And you will be frog marched out of there. 
you will be frog marched out of there. And everybody's going to put it on Twitter and that's exactly where you need to be. And if anyone sends you this video by mistake, you will know that God is talking directly to you in the middle of your lie. The cops are going to come in. And if anyone doubts it, you can go and watch the prophecy. It's not yet written down, but it has been made a video. I think in the middle part of this year, it's called peanut butter, peanut butter, a tough one. In that prophecy, I saw that God had brought me to seat me with the others who had already been doing this work. And when I came in, I saw that the era had changed. All the glitz and the glamour had gone out of pastoring and leading. It was all gone. The dogs and the wolves of the generations past, hello T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, and family, they had eaten all the cake. They had eaten up all the good of the soft era of Christianity. When people opened their purses willingly and built up the house of God because they thought that they were doing something worthwhile. They thought that they were building the Lord's house, but they were just building the million dollar jet portfolio and the 500 houses that are put under shelf companies and stacked secretly so that people will never know where the money goes. That era had soured Christianity. And the stink of it, like cigarette smoke, was still in the room. And God showed me the vision. And when I got into the room, there were only three pastors there. A very old one, old school, who still kept his books in order, who still believed in holiness, sanctification, who still believed in sitting down and using the Bible to write his own sermon, wasn't going to sermon.com to get something on Saturday night, 11.59 p.m. And there were two other pastors and they were watching the fall of the pastors. And I said that I was watching, one was watching on a device, maybe a tablet, maybe a cell phone, and the other one that was a big TV. And I said, I was astounded to see on the TV. You could have almost called the channel that we were watching, the channel where pastors get embarrassed and ashamed and taken to jail. I said that I was seeing pastors standing there stark naked in cuffs and the FBI guy was FBI guys were standing there and going, yeah, so he's being arraigned for, and they were reading out the charges and leaving nothing out. They were answering the press. I said, I saw pastor stark naked. And the only little piece of dignity that they had is that their hands were cuffed and they were holding their hands in front of them to preserve male modesty. And it was like <laughs> paparazzi at its best. And the two pastors in the room were men who had stayed faithful to God, but I could see that their hearts had been pricked. According to what exactly I said at the beginning of this video, how long it can sometimes seem that God is taking before he moves. These men were shocked, but at the same time, they were happy in their hearts because they were saying, finally, at last, at last. They were pleased. They were almost gleeful to see these wicked people falling. What were pastors going down for? Financial fraud, stealing, cooking the books. Joyce Meyer, the Lord says that you will be exposed for the fact that you do this. You will be exposed. They've audited you before and you got away with it. You're an oily lady. They will catch you for cooking the books. TBN will go down because they're broke. Almost 50 years or perhaps more. It's not accurate the time that they've been in. I don't know exactly. TBN has been in business and a business it is for years, but God says you will go completely broke. Potter's house, you will follow. That place will be turned into a mall or some other recreational center. I have brought out all these messages. I leave nothing out because God must be vindicated in the earth. Christians love to follow popularity. They love to follow big names. You will sit out there and the people you have been arguing for when I have been bringing out the prophetic word of the Lord, you've been defending them. Oh, she's trying to be relevant, relevant with slime. How is this possible? How can I be relevant with Freemasons? How can I be relevant with satanic, with satanic people, satanists, ritualists, sacrificers, occultists, people who curse the sanctuary on Saturday nights, and then people come in 
and they fall under the oppressive spells of the devil. How can somebody that God took aside and hid for his portion, you never knew I was breathing air until God was ready to reveal me four years ago. How can I want to seek relevance with people who are on their way out, some of them to the grave? What an odd way to make a name. No, this is the truth. Peanut butter, the prophecy where I saw pastors go down for financial fraud, just as I had been saying previously to that prophecy that they will be caught for fraud and their churches will be shut and their members will be scattered. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. All you members that have pastors that are stealing money, you're going to go and fellowship with the sister churches and the brother churches of that ministry or wherever you can go. So if you can smell it in the wind, it's best to start seeking God now for where you're going because you will surely go. These churches will be turned into malls, sports centers. They will be empty. God would rather have them empty than you sitting in there like goats while they play badminton with your mind and your soul, corrupting you and sacrificing you in the spirit, enriching themselves at your loss at your cost, at your ignorance, and also in some cases at your stubborn insistence to support what is clearly fallen, but you think you know better than God, but God is more merciful and he loves you more than you deserve. And that is why he will pluck you out of these defiled places, masquerading as churches and shut them down. He would rather they have a models in there. He would rather these kids be buying sneakers on sale than you going in there and playing church, a parody of righteousness. Pastors will go down for murder because not only do they commit spiritual sacrifice, they kill their members. God says that there are pastors who are embroiled in scandals. They have killed to keep secrets quiet. And some of those secrets is the fact that they are gay as Sunday picnics. They have killed to stop that information coming out, that they like and prefer men. Pastors have paid for murder. Pastors have physically committed murder. Like the old man who was caught, I think he's 83 years old, killed the little daughter of a family friend who was also a pastor. And for decades, those people have been grieving that little girl only to find him now, old, rusty, and decrepit robbed that family of a baby and thought he was going to actually go to wherever because it surely wasn't heaven with that crime uncovered. They caught him and they will catch many more of you. They will find the secret documents that you killed to protect. And as you do time for it, you will ask yourself if, if protecting a piece of land, the land you wanted to build the church on, you will ask yourself if protecting that piece of land or protecting your homosexual urges that you could not confess to the Lord because they were too much for you, and then you indulged them, got caught, got it on tape, you were willing to take life to hide that. You were willing to hide your pedophilia under the knife of murder, the gun of murder. It will come out. Pastors, you are not exempt from the judgment of the Lord because the Lord is just. Why should he favor you? and hide your sin and allow the Bitcoin people or the movie people to go to court and have themselves exposed. The reason that the pastors were stark naked in that prophecy, in the dream that I had, is because they won't spare the details. That's what happens when the details are not spared. Everything will be exposed. And the thing about court documents is you win on the basis of minutia. Minutia is every single tiny little line, every detail, every hair that you remember. Court documents can be excruciating. Ask Mr. Sean Combs. He settled his lawsuit in one day. They can be excruciating. They say everything. They leave you naked. That's why the pastors will be naked. God says it will not be formulaic confession anymore. You're not just going to come out with the crocodile tears and the soft voice telling us how you struggled. 
He says your old crimes will come out uncovered by the witnesses. So the people who actually suffered are going to talk like that young lady who went up to the pastor as he was preaching and began to shout her abuse, how he raped her on the floor of her office, of his office at the church, the sanctuary, the house of God, when she was only 16. And it took her, she came when, when she was in either her 20s or her 30s, when she finally got married, married, it took her that long to find the courage to find her voice to come and accuse him. But how did that saga end? Church of Jesus Christ here in America, how did that story end in middle America? Was the pastor castigated? There was some yelling. How could you do that, pastor? But before you know it, he switched on the charm and he began to tell them about his moral failure. And the way that situation of confrontation ended is that the young woman and her husband left without so much as a hug from anyone. And the church gathered around the pastors to hug him and to tell him it's all right, pastor. We're with you. Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes that have lost their function. A lymphocyte is a white blood cell. The work of a lymphocyte, this word was given to me in the prophecy that is called sympathizers of sin. That is one of the most accurate messages the Holy Spirit has ever given me. If you've never watched it, you should go and watch it. Sympathizers of sin. A lymphocyte is a white blood cell and God's intention of our white blood cells is to identify viruses and kill them. So the white blood cell is instinctively created, divinely designed to identify what does not belong in the body and strike it in unison until it dies. The work of the white blood cell is to eliminate a virus from the midst so that we as the body does not sicken. But God says that his church today are broken lymphocytes. They surround the virus and protect it. They surround the virus of sin dwelling in our midst and love on it and tell it, you're all right. We're all human, false prophet. We all miss it sometimes, midway, sometimes, a lot of times, all the times. We all make videos that become more and more irrelevant as the years pass and it becomes clear that Jeremiah was right that the false prophets make prophecies that don't happen, but they hope that God will cause it to come to pass. That's all right, rapist pastor. You were under pressure. Who of us doesn't lust after a 16 year old body? That church embarrassed itself, but it also shamed and angered the Lord. And that's the kind of thing that God will not tolerate anymore. You go touching on children, it will come out, your entire stash will be found. And by the grace of God, may the rest of your life be under the jail. It will no longer be a church matter that will be settled privately. No apologies, no community time off. Isn't that what they love? I'm stepping down momentarily. It's just an act of subterfuge. I need to take time away with the Lord. I need to, I need to, you need to repent, sir, ma'am. You need to stop lying to yourself, first of all, because you are unrehabilitated, Mr. John Gray. You are not changed. This is a name God has been bringing up. In the last two weeks, the Lord keeps bringing up this man's name. And in the prophecy, the end of the way of the wicked, it's either the end of the way of the wicked, that was part one, and the prophecy that came right after it is called the way of the wicked is darkness and thorns. That man, John Gray, was mentioned by the Lord. And the, man, and the Lord says that the man is an unrehabilitated addict. That he's unrepentant. So all those lives that he makes, family. Family, I was a broken young man. I, my inner child. His inner child loves to sleep with women who are not his wife. 
body of Christ, you will hear the truth today. If I have to stay up at 2 a.m., we will discuss this line by line and precept by precept. For this too is the word of the Lord. Unrehabilitated. That means that you they can put themselves on timeout for three weeks, three months. It's never a long enough time to rebuild the whole man. And that's because they have a lust for relevance. Another thing that the Holy Spirit is speaking to. They confess and make empty emotional appeals to be forgiven so that the perpetrator, perpetrator is the word we use for criminals, by the way. It's the one who commits foul acts, criminal acts, evil acts. It is a criminal act to sleep with a minor and then think that it has, it's only a forgiveness issue. No, sir. It is a crime. You are a rapist and a pedophile. That's two counts. Forgiveness is a secondary matter after you get charged for the crimes. But these people cry on stage. They make empty emotional appeals to be forgiven. And God says they do it to stay relevant. If you don't appear to be sorry in this emotional victim culture age, how do you expect to get your church slaves defending you in all the blogs? He didn't mean it. He said he was sorry. Pastor Boggins is a good man. He's a good man. Is this not the same prophecy that I brought in 2022 where God says that after these children are assaulted or after these women are assaulted, tricked, assaulted, get pregnant, forced to abort a baby for their pastor, that a few deacons will get together, a few deaconesses, a couple elders, one or two old ladies in there to really round out the posse. And then he says they go to the victim's house and they sit there rocking back and forth. Think of the church. Think of what it'll do to the community. They go and they manipulate and they play mind games on someone who has already been hurt and harmed. And then they go and further hurt that person and subject them to a lifetime of silence to growing rage as they watch, who as they watch the perp stand on stage. This is my wife and my children, a godly example of the family. Those people come to hate church. By extension, those people come to hate Christians. And why shouldn't they? With so much falsehood, and broken, broken lymphocytes in the church, sympathizers of sin. When the truth is spoken, they hate the truth speaker. They hate the voice trumpeting about dirt done in the dark. And that's because the things you defend are a reflection of your own sick heart. I've always said, if you are a Christian and people bring up big ticket items, like homosexuality, like abortion, like whether it's possible for a woman to become a man because she calls herself Dave and takes some hormones. If you are found on any side of the fence that isn't Jesus' side of the fence, you're not defending that issue because of you think the issue is right. You're defending that issue because of an abnormality in your heart. Your very inside is twisted already. You're already a victim of Romans chapter one, verses 18, all the, one, all the way to 32. You're already a broken toy that just makes a grinding noise. So no one can actually expect you to have a righteous perspective because you yourself are not righteous. So the only thing that you can do is defend unrighteousness. Because unrighteousness is brokenness of sin before the Lord. And you who defend it, you're broken too. And that is why Romans chapter one and verse 32 is one of the best verses on earth. Because all the verses list all the sins, but Romans 32 just wraps it up. 132, it wraps it up so neatly. And it tells you that this long list is the list of the perps, the sinners. But verse 32 is for you that defend the sin and attempt to call unrighteousness, righteousness, darkness, light, evil, good, salt, Sweet, you that twist and pervert reality, you are as much a sinner as the rest. And that's why God says, you know that the sins that they have committed are deserving of death. 
but you defend them. And so you will be part of the judgment that they receive. That, that's one of the most perfect verses in scripture. Succinct. If a murder is committed and you try to find reasons that the murderer took that life, when he gets his sentence, you're going to be shocked to hear your name read out as one of the defendants. Because you and he, killer and defender of the killer, are one in the courts of heaven. If nobody preached that to you on a Sunday, it's worth a look. Criminal charges are coming. Evidence uncovered by witnesses, people who saw it happened, people who were threatened to keep hush, and the victims, people it happened to. And God says we're not going into the era of the criminal charges. It will no longer be a private church matter that you can apologize for. You can say, I'll take community time off. They stepped down, but they're back like a yo-yo. John Gray was back like a yo-yo. Chris Hill was back like a yo-yo. They all come back like a yo-yo because the pulpit makes people punch drunk. They hunger and they lust for the relevance. And that mushroom fungus inside them is not healed. And that's why we constantly keep seeing them back in the gossip blogs. And God says money won't hush it either. No longer, says the Lord, you are wicked and unrepentant. You play on public sympathy, but you forget that there is a judge in heaven who sees the desires of your heart. Therefore, you will be exposed, condemned, and forced to face criminal trials to answer for what you have done. Those who sin against the Lord's people will be going to jail, just like everybody else who commits crimes. And in terms of who will go to jail and why they will go to jail, what Yah told me is that he has saved the best for last. So normally, the money-stealing people in the banking world don't go to jail. The people who caused 2008 didn't go to jail. Rupert Murdoch was an anomaly, a glitch, almost a mistake of the U.S. criminal justice system. Because guys that high up don't go to jail. They get rich lawyers, they fandangle, and then they walk free, and they go and sit on their private island, and they have a low profile for a couple of years, and then they're back with another hedge fund, this time with their son at the forefront and with them at the back still doing exactly what they did before. There's no justice in the US criminal justice system. It's a bought out system. It's a bribed out system. Anybody who walks in there hoping to find justice, you better be walking in there with Jesus as your lawyer and then the real lawyer as your backup. And it's getting more and more defunct and more and more decrepit and more and more hilarious. And New Yorkers will tell you that with the recent overturning of the camp law. And I watch these things and I just wonder, what do people expect? What do you think the purpose of the prophecies are really for? If God says that camps will exist, who and what law is going to stop those camps existing? The Father has spoken that the camps are the punishment and that many people are going to end their days in them. And that's final. That means that from the time he spoke it, when I spoke it in the prophecy, disease and decay in America in 2021, that I saw the government rise and create horrifyingly stringent camps because they were horrifyingly stringent disease. COVID-19 is just what people know for now. I said that the rise of the fatal bumps, those diseases that don't have names, those diseases that the Lord simply told me are called, these are pandemic, pandemic sicknesses, celestial. They will be called pandemic sicknesses because of how fast they spread, because of how toxic and virulent they are. 
how easy they will be to catch and how much life will be lost. And the government's going to see that and get on top of that. And they are going to, if you think what happened in Asia was something, those stringent methods of isolation, seek out, catch, drag from the house. If you thought, my goodness, if you saw that, if you were even bothering to care about those people, Thanksgiving 2019, when those videos were coming out, few outlets were covering those atrocities and people thought it can never happen here, but it will. It is prophecy. So that means the show and the progress and the pattern and the road to get there is just the inevitable dragging of human feet. Because people really think that if we only get together and we vote the right way and we get the wrong people out and we appeal and we roll the stone, you roll the stone and the stone is going to roll right back on you because the word of God, the prophetic messages of the Lord is a crushing stone. And so whoever tries to roll that stone, it will roll right back on you. So smart people seeing the stone rolling back will simply move right out of its way. If they appeal and win now, they'll just roll it out another way. And if they appeal here and defeat it, like whack-a-mole, it will pop up in another state where it will not be defeated. And that's because the prophetic word did not say that I saw the government take stringent measures in New York state. I said this nation became riddled with unknown, dangerous, virulent diseases, even diseases of old. And the whole place was locked down and the government practiced cold hearted isolationist measures to get ahead of those sicknesses. So the camp doesn't have to start here, start in good old Wichita. It could start in Florida where they think nothing can ever happen to them. It can start anywhere as long as it starts because all they need is a precedent, don't they? All they need is a win somewhere. And then whoever tries to go to court to fight it, you can always be overturned by bought out judges, sold out beast system judges in a corrupt system who will tell you, according to Peterson, Peterson versus the state of Texas, you don't have moral standing. This is established law. They don't need a New York win. Any win will do because God has spoken it and it will come. And wise people who know that the word of God is the word of God will move out of its way. And so God says that he has saved the best for last, the biggest names for last in terms of who will go to jail and why they go to jail. He has kept the most shocking reveals. So people complain, God is not just, this person got away with it, that person got away with it. The Bible says that wicked people are storing up wrath for the day of judgment. That means that the names you wanted to see in the 80s and the 90s, unless they died, in which case they've stored up the worst wrath. If they died with those sins upon them, that's the worst wrath. That's eternally out of the presence of God. That's judgment. That's hell. That's no holds barred. That's forever separation with God. That's the worst wrath. But even if they're old and they're still alive, they'll catch them because God is just. And he won't leave any stone unturned. Especially to people who have been sexually victimized sexually hurt. This thing is a very important thing. I'm not talking to fornicators because they don't know how to value what they have. They're just out there treating pounds like pennies. I'm talking to people who have this kind of thing forced upon them, whether by pastors, whether by your rich boss, whether by the female managers who manipulate the young men and get them to do these kinds of things. This was in one of the live prophecies to my shock, 
God talking about female managers who leverage their position to basically rape the young men, force and corner them into relationships that they don't necessarily want to have. And God said some of them do, but some of them don't. But a man can be put in jeopardy of his job, his position, just as easily as a woman. This is if you come outside the fever dream of the, fi- of the feminine brain, the feminist brain, and you just think like a normal person. Everybody wants to keep their employment. Everybody wants to protect their job. But God was saying that there's a whole hierarchy of high-ranking women inviting these young men out to inappropriate dinners and charging it to the company card, making them propositions, promoting them through sex. This thing has been weaponized across the world. And in this nation, it's no different. And that is why I had to trudge my way through the sodomy series because God was looking at Africa. He was looking at West Africa, East Africa. He was looking at Africa and how it is being defiled by men propositioning men in order for a man to finally have his first job. He commits that act. He thinks it's over. And then three months later, you're getting a private email telling you, oh, my brother is going to be in town. We want you to drop by the house. And then this person realizes with a sinking feeling, I haven't had a job in six years. I got this job. I thought I had put the method of how I got the job behind me. But now this man, this young man, even a middle-aged man who's desperate for work to feed his family, God was showing me how these politicians, These musicians, these high ranking people will keep pulling you into that net until eventually God says they will go gay. They will go gay. That's what he said, because this act is so demonic that if you break the gate of a person's soul like that, male or female, This is what God was saying they do to the stars. If you break the gate of a person's soul like that, eventually there's no buffer. There's no protection. He says the men will prefer men. And isn't this what was in the four part series prophecy, the reprobates arising in America where God, I saw the thing and I said, no, it can't be. I can be quite adamant even in my dreams. I was like, this is not real. I was yelling in the street. I said, this is not real. And God, you need to make it stop right now. Everybody was gay. Everybody except the parrots and the cockatoos. The cockatoos. Everyone was gay. Man with man, woman with woman, trans with trans, and back again. I was traumatized. I was basically like a child saying to him, fix it, fix it. It can't be real. It can't be everyone. And I was speaking by the spirit recently in a video where I said that the fallenness is going to continue. A man, an older man, you will know that man, I said. 65, an older man has brought four kids into this world and then he will come out And he will tell you, oh, I was confused all along. I'm actually a non-binary, non-binary, non-transitory, mostly gay. Few days later, well-known, well-known comedian, Wayne Brady, comes out and tells the world he's Pan. Not Peter Pan. Pan just means open to sleep with everyone. But the realization that God put on my heart when that thing was once again trending, where in the news, where the fallen Christians prefer to get truth. What God put in my heart was, he said to me, Celestial, this man has been married. He is the father of at least one child. Apparently this man has one daughter. He says, when you come out and say, oh, I'm Pan, Women were not off the table for you. That only leaves one other sex that you could not have access to, that you can now reach into. Men. It's a distressing time that we live in. But what's more distressing is that the people who form the gate, the buffer wall, are out of alignment. 
They are out of their respectable position. They are out of proper placement. And it is a shame. And until it is corrected, messages like this will not cease. God will have to bring the justice divinely because he can't count on the church of Jesus Christ to pray for the justice. I bet that even as this young woman brought out her story, it is more a subject of chitter chatter than it is to actually band together. You young women could have easily been a victim like this. This doesn't only happen to the rich and famous. It happens all the way down the tears. It happens to babies. But did anybody pray for her? Did anybody pray for her justice? Did anybody pray so that this matter will move out of the realm of a civil suit and into the realm of a criminal accusation where the state steps in and says, well, Mr. Combs, we don't care if you paid money for a settlement. You actually, cre you actually committed crimes. You committed crimes. We're taking it up from here. Whether you gave her money or not, that's a civil issue. We're actually charging you with crimes. Does the church pray or does the church just click, click, click voyeurs, just like the world? What a shame. What a shame the times that we're in. The Lord says arrest warrants will be issued for the biggest names across all spectrums, sports, I have a prophecy. I haven't made it yet. You that like being the available groupies of the NFL stars, NASCAR stars, basketball stars. Some of those men are not right. Some of those men are modified. Some of those men are not really full people. And others of those men, because of the lifestyles that they live, God showed me that they will be open up to very extremely destroying and violent spirits. And when you volunteer to go back to the hotel room with them, you will regret it like you have never regretted anything in your life. And I'm going to tell you bluntly, the word the Lord used in that dream was torn. You will be torn. Torn. You will be a battered wreck that the front desk is actually going to have to participate in hiding. The front desk is going to have to help those criminal young men to hide you because of what they will do to you, male and female. And the Lord showed me and I wrote it down. It is on my blog. The Lord showed me that those of you who managed to leave that hotel room alive. He said, for the rest of your life, you will never want another sexual interaction with anyone. You will never want anyone to touch you. That's how bad your trauma will be because you lack wisdom. You lack discernment, but you also lack respect for the ways of God. I'm going to keep this prophecy separate because this prophecy has many, many, many parts, but the Holy Spirit is bringing out things that he has been putting upon me, but lack of time has prevented me from coming and making these prophecies. And on top of that, they are not issues that I can say, I am writing this down because the Lord has declared this and this and this. This is just dialogue from the Lord, dialogue that has been, he's been bringing to me. It's not a prophecy that I can open the Lord's blog and come and write it down to say that people who are not rehabilitated, people who still have that inner lust, and the name is John Gray, you will see that man again in the press. You will see him who always claims that it's his inner pain. It's his inner pain that makes him to sin. It's his inner lust. That lust has not been healed. That lust has not been confessed. It has never been confessed. It has never been laid down at the foot of the cross. And the Lord says he will even judge his wife. Why? For accepting it. She's an accessory to the, cr to the crime. She's his own lymphocyte, his personal lymphocyte. He says he will judge them both. Him because he is unrepentant and her because she's an enabler. 
But then the crowd out there will be like, no, but she's hurt, Celestial. I think you just don't understand. It's you who don't understand because your Bible is dusty. You read from the Bible of your own thoughts. My purple ba Bible is battered. I've only had it since 2016, and it looks like it's done 10 tours in Vietnam. You don't read your Bible, so you don't know the heart of God. You don't know his will. You think his will is the church of you. You're not trained and you're not submissive to the truth. You go and drink from the fountain of popular culture. Victim culture, ally culture, let's love the sinner culture. In the church of Jesus Christ, the love for the sinner is not contingent. We are told to love our fellow man. But at the same time, we also see that Achan was separated from the rest of the church and stoned. And don't come with that Old Testament thing. The Old Testament contains very graphic pictures of the justice of God. And the, the sickness of the modern church is to think that the justice of God died on the cross with Jesus Christ. You are so wrong. Jesus Christ died on the cross to delay the justice that was owed to each and every one of us. But if we abuse that grace, if we think that the flowing of that blood meant that it's open season on fornication, which I'm going to touch on next, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. Justice will come. And so I will add two things here. One of those things is this. It's a warning to young people. The Lord has been bringing up this warning for a while now. And like I said, when the Lord brings these things, I, I regard them in my heart. I keep them in my heart. Father, I've heard you. And as your spirit leads, as I'm bringing out these prophecies, I will, I will bring it in. This is the perfect one to bring it in. Reluctant Christians, the people I just spoke about five seconds ago, you think that Jesus' death on the cross means that it's open season on sin. Young people especially, the Lord says that your funerals are near. Go and say it on TikTok. Go and say it on Instagram. She's judging us. She's cursing us. I have no interest in those things. Words are very powerful. They need to be managed. They're very powerful. And the word of the Lord to you is this. Unrepentant sinner, especially the young people, your funerals are near. And the way God brought this message is that he prefaced it with one of the visions that I mentioned when I was doing the young people prophecies, when the Lord shocked this skin off me by showing me what young people do. I knew that un young people are disrespectful. I knew that they are rebellious. I knew that they are lovers of themselves. I knew that they lie, that they steal, that they fornicate. What I didn't know are things like they drug one of them and then 10 people sleep with that person. I didn't know that something called a running train exists to drug a person and then use that person and tape that person and then share the video at school and cause that person to probably want to commit suicide or probably need to go into witness protection or probably have to uproot a family because the child simply cannot live in that town anymore. The child cannot have a normal life in that town. Force them to move across the country to give their baby a new life as new as she can possibly get after going through trauma like that. I did not know until I did not know that young people are live streaming themselves in, in, in their own homes using the internet that their parents pay for on these porn sites, such as OnlyFans. I had never heard that word in my life until someone who is too young to know about it told me, but auntie, don't you know about this? There are many things I did not know, but in that prophecy, as I was going through the shock of learning, and then as I was dutifully bringing out what God was saying, I saw a vision 
And this vision has been coming back to me steadily, steadily, steadily over the last, I would say, six or seven days. And whenever that is coming from the wide panorama of all the visions that I've seen, all the dreams that I have dreamt over these last 11 years, when something just pops up and just begins to promote itself and lift itself up, then I know God is putting his finger on this thing. And soon this thing is going to come into, it's going to snap into peace like a puzzle piece. It's going to snap into place. It's going to become relevant. And the vision that I saw is the one where I was prophesying and I was saying, young people, you want to keep holding on to sin. You're going to let it go through a funeral. And here's the pity. I said, there'll be five of you, same sin, almost like roulette. So nobody on this end of the world will be able to answer why the five of you do the same thing. The five of you are the masturbation bros. The five of you are the, the drug kingpins. You're either selling it to some people at school or you all buy it and sit and get high together in a group and then compare your trippy experiences. The five of you go around pretending to women that you care about them, sleeping with them. This could be 25, 28 year olds. They're not exempt. Declaring love to get sex, ghost the person, get together after a month. How many did you get, bro? How many did you get, bro? Five of you, the same sin. Nobody worse, nobody better. The same sin. I saw a funeral. That's the vision that God has been bringing back to me. I saw a funeral, young people, five friends, five boys, all different ethnicities standing together. One of them died. As his coffin was going down into the ground, all the other boys were standing and their hands were bunched up. The four who were living as the thing, the button that they press that final goodbye, as it began to go into the ground, I saw the other four hands open and drop. And I said, what a pity, what a pity to be forced to drop your sin because of death. And here's the kicker. You, the one who dies, you won't get a do over. I said, you will be the testimony that saves your friends. You will be the revival that saves your friends. When you die, the rest of them will find Jesus Christ. The only problem is that you'll be dead, cut off a tree, hacked off before it's time, right at the roof, at the roots. The ax will be set to the roots of the trees because some of you are so stubborn. You really think that God is your butler. You think he's going to stand around and wait on you the way the waiter does in a really good restaurant. He will show you different. America, you will let go. Nations of the world, you will let go of this reckless love doctrine. Whoever taught you this poison, that there's no door he won't kick down, there's no river he won't swim in to get you. You will understand what it is meant by judgment is waiting, that wrath is abiding that it's the end times. You will understand what it means when it says, come out of Babylon. It doesn't mean run and get your passport first. It means separate yourself from all the sins of Babylon. And the sins of Babylon are international, global. There's no nation without trans now. We just need to see them out in the Sahara desert and then we can call it a day. There's no nation without abortion. There's no nation without pedophilia. There's no nation without rituals. And Americans would like to argue, we didn't teach them all that. You popularized it. You put it in the movies. You're the one who's popularized all the filthy song lyrics. How dare you try to say that it's not you? I'm not accusing you falsely. I'm right lining up with scripture, Revelation 18. If there was filth, you brought filth on stage and dressed it up and handed it award after award and praised it and said, you're all right, filth. You step right on in. You're family. The Lord told me to tell you that your funerals are coming. What a pity. What a pity. What a shame. 
someone will learn the lesson and that person will go into the ground. And then the remaining people will learn what we call the moral of the story. Someone will become the lesson. Keep fornicating. You will become the lesson. You will become the module. What not to do with a God who is coming to bring righteousness back to the earth and teach us obedience by the things that we will suffer. That will be the name of the class. Some people will not graduate from that class, but everybody else who escapes as through fire, those will be the evangelists of the end times, ready to talk to anybody on the train about Jesus. I saw that they dropped the sin. When the other friend went into the ground, his sin took him out so he didn't get a chance to open his hand. The remaining four bros, they opened their hand and they dropped the sin. You will drop sin and become justified, not even because you wanted to. And the Bible has stories for people like that. Two names coming to me right now, Nebuchadnezzar and Jonah. After they went through the school of don't mess with God, they came out completely different men. So they got the lesson and they also lived to get the moral of the story. But Nebuchadnezzar also got the lesson and his son died. So he didn't get to get the moral of the story. And that's because some people are stubborn and some people will hear all this and say, I just think she's too hard. And I just think she's this. And, and what you think has no bearing on the words that I'm saying, because the words that I'm speaking, they are spirit and they are life. And I know that there are people who will already testify and say, it already happened to me. I saw something happen to my, to my cousin and I, I'm not trying to go out that way. The second thing that I must say, because the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me this. So I was asleep and he woke me up to tell me this. And this is to people who fornicate. The Lord told me to tell you that if you are someone who has been coming here for any length of time and you've been hearing his messages and you've been hearing his truth and you've been hearing the prophecy and you've been hearing that Russia will come and take away people who fornicate and people who commit sexual immorality and people who trance, the Lord says that if you are a person of sexual immorality and you have been listening to the prophecies of the master's voice and still going to fornicate, he told me to tell you to leave this place. I'm just going to close my ears to all the people. Jesus didn't drive anyone away. Jesus often walked away from people. Go read your Bible. The Lord told me to tell you that you are abusing grace. He told me to tell you that you are abusing mercy. The Bible says that today, today, that means whichever day you started listening here, Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. I think that's Hebrews 3. It also goes on to say how they angered God with their hard-heartedness because they saw all the works that he had worked for their fathers in the desert and it was still not enough for them. They could not obey. They saw everything that he did to bring them out of captivity to bring them, draw, draw them to himself. They saw him fight Pharaoh to free them. And then when he brought them out to the wilderness, they became calcified like bone, hard like bone, stubborn, rebellious in their heart. They heard him speaking through Moses, but they thought, what's a Moses? What's a prophet? What's a... And he says that he swore that they would never enter his rest and that their carcasses, this is their dead bodies that then rotted, just like a deer that you shoot at 100 yards in the forest. Their carcasses dropped. God loved those people, and he sat there for 40 years and conducted all their funerals, right? That's old Ebenezer, 109. He watched them all perish until the last one was dead, until only Joshua and Caleb were the only two old people, plus Moses. 
And then he said to Moses, you've gone around the mountain long enough. Turn and enter the promised land. It is a deadly thing to mistake God. It is a deadly thing to grow up in a theology that tells you that the God from the first half of the Bible handed over his power to some other person in the second half, and he's not the same person. When he says that I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, I am the Lord, I change not. This is what he says about himself. But then American theology says, no, 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 he's not like that anymore. God said to tell you, fornicator, that come here and have heard the entire sin series. So you watched it from the beginning. You watched all the videos where he's talking about sexual immorality, how it is an affront to him. It is an insult to God to misuse your temple, to indulge your desires, to put the word of God behind your back and sink to your baser nature, whether it's looking at porn whether it's lusting after women, lusting after men, whether it's pleasuring yourself, whether it's a secret fetish, you're wearing male boxers, but you're a woman because you're, you're, you're starting unknown to you. You, you claim it's comfortable, but you are already opening the door for your trans journey that we will suddenly see pop up on your Instagram without warning one day, because that's how it starts. The prophecy for that is called stay true to your own gender. Stay true to your own gender. A prophecy all the way from 2018 where God shows me that a little crack is all the devil needs to widen it to the Grand Canyon. And you will go gay or go trans or I don't know if it's possible to be both, but you definitely won't be yourself. If you have been hearing the word of the Lord, to come out of fornication, to stop having affairs if you are married, to stop sleeping around if you are a widower or a widow, divorced, if you have been hearing God say, be holy as I am holy, and you have continued to defy him. I don't know what she's talking about. I think that this is just too tough. It's harder than she thinks. If you think that there's a standard for you and then a standard for everybody else, the Lord told me to tell you to depart this place. And I'm not in a position to know if he's telling you to depart this place, because if you continue to stay here and defy the truth of the word of God, he may strike you. Or if he's simply saying away from me, out of my presence, go to the life you are choosing, the father you are acknowledging, the father, not of faith, but of flesh, Satan, Lucifer, the devil. I'm not one for conjecture. I'm one for raw truth as it is given to me. The Lord told me to tell you to get off this place because you are defiant in your sin. Go away. When you humble yourself, when you confess your sin, when you subject your flesh, when you crucify your lusts, when you sit in your house and fast those incubus and succubus off your back, when your skin isn't itching like a junkie for a late night hookup, and you actually want to hear what the word of the Lord is for people who want to know what is on God's mind, then come back. But as long as you are rolling around in those bed sheets, God told me to tell you. He said, tell them, I said, depart this place. So that means that you have now heard what the Lord has instructed me to tell you. And that means that if you keep up that life and you come back here, you are not only proving what the Father has said, that you are defeated defiance against grace, mercy, him giving you time to work through it, him giving you time to cry out. But now you now come back because you're like, it's the internet. She can't stop it. Then you're forgetting the spiritual aspect of all things. You're forgetting that I don't know you and that I can't see you, but somebody does know you and watches you 24 seven. Jesus CCTV. You're now stepping into that place where you want to be a Pharaoh and pharaohs always have 
interesting endings. It's, it's always the same ending, no matter how it happens. The Bible has a ton of Pharaoh endings. There were many, many defiant people, but they all ended one way. Because if there's one thing God will always offer all clients, it's justice, equality, and consistency. He is consistent. That is what gives us. That is what is supposed to give us room to trust him. He's always consistent. What he did for people in the Old Testament, he will, and what he did for people in the New Testament, he will do for you now. You can trust him. He always delivers. He's always the same. He doesn't change. He loved them. He loved us. He cared for them. He will care for us. He will care for us even into the camps and beyond whatever the camps contain. But should you defy the living God? Well, Pharaoh's story is there for reference. This prophecy, I will call this a part one. The name of the prophecy will be put on it when I bring it up. This is only the first part. This is the part that the Lord gave me between 1 to 2 a.m. on November 25th, 2023. And because it is dealing with justice, it is dealing with God judging righteously, as he says he will in Psalm 9, that he will answer and he will remember blood, especially shed. Righteousness is its own reward. So I will call this a part one and part two of the prophecy will be made because it is very interesting. It's a very detailed dream that the Lord gave me and that would be a little bit lengthy because I'm not going to leave anything out. And so in good conscience, I will not attach it to this part. This part literally can stand on its own. So until I see you again, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you and may every heart, may every heart have heard all that I have said, because during this prophecy, you have heard all the prophecies. You have heard the names of the prophecies that I have been giving to back up what I am saying. God is not going to tolerate the whitewashing of sin in the church anymore. And since the church to its shame, since the church is not able to identify sinners in our midst, you don't understand the righteousness of God's process in identifying sin. People today are so corrupt. You are so corrupt, many of you. Satan has worked on your mind so much that you actually think that the process of identifying sin is judging, don't judge others. We are condemning the sin because sin has eternally been a poison in our midst. The justification of those who protect sin will always say, you will always find out when the next gospel singer comes out gay. At least he's living his truth. Are we saved to live our truth? Is there any mention of our truth from the beginning to the end of the Bible? Aren't we told? That our hearts are so deceiving that it's possible for us to walk around fools about our own truth? Can the truth of human beings ever be trusted? Doesn't the Bible say that it is not in man? It is not in man to know his own way. Meaning that someone can come up to you and tell you, you know, we in the office, we, well, we just wanted to talk to you. We feel that you're like this. And then you become offended and angry because you feel they're attacking you. And the truth is, you are like that. They are the ones who are experiencing you. They're telling you, but it is not in a man to know his own way, his own actions, how he is. It is the Holy Spirit who will reveal that to us. But the church has been corrupted, inverted, turned upside down. Don't identify sin. Don't point at sin. Don't expose sin. Cover it instead and justify it. And I've always said, and I said in this video, if your first response when you hear sin judged is to open your mouth and say, but you are already in sin yourself. You are a defender of sin. You are a broken and perverted lymphocyte. You love sin and you want to have it covered in others because you are hoping for it to be covered in yourself. The righteous man 
will say like David, search me, O Lord, and see if there is any evil way in me. But that is a lost art in our generation. Very few actually know that identifying sin pinpoints it because it is a cancer that spreads much faster than natural cancers. Sin jumps. Sin jumps from pastor to people, and sin jumps from person to person. You get fornication in a congregation, pretty soon everybody will be doing it. Homosexuality, trans, these things are powered by very powerful demons. They transfer. That's why the first conversation you ask people struggling in this lifestyle, it usually goes like, I first became aware of it around this, this, that time. Because that thing, as God has shown it to me, it usually comes in through very early abuse, touching on babies, the sickos who should not be allowed to reproduce or to have children in their care, touching on kids. Early sexual touching breaks the gates of the soul. That's why the Bible says, don't stir up love until the time. Don't go opening doors and kindling things that should not be kindled before it's time. But when you abuse children in this way, you tear, you tear those babies. You rip open the gates of their soul and you give evil ones access. And what they do is they go in there and then they, they nest up and they wait just like sick eggs waiting to hatch until consciousness comes into the child. Until the baby begins to edge into selfhood, knows its name, knows I am a little girl. Those are boys. They all grasp that in the beginning. If they don't grasp that in the beginning, there would be no struggle. Every girl knows she's a girl and every boy knows he's a boy. The struggle is the rotten egg is trying to burst through to destroy identity. We are made we are made by intelligent design. And the intelligent designer has named everything. That is part of his power, the ability to name everything. He is the one who named sky firmament. He named Adam. And then he transferred to Adam that right, that same creative power to name a thing. And the Bible says the Lord watched to see what Adam would call things. And then whatever Adam called them, that was their name, cow, sheep. That was their name, Eve. That was her name. So this is a God-given power, identity. And Satan, the twister, the perverter, plants these evil eggs. And as selfhood is established, I am a little girl, I am a little boy, that egg begins to beat. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. And then in come the architects of insanity now in the last days. Taylor knew that she was a boy when she was two. She couldn't control her bowel movements, but she had nailed complicated sexuality at age two. America. <laughs> I'm Celestial, and this is the Master's Voice Prophecy Blog. The Master's Voice is a written resource, first and foremost. You can find it at www.the-masters-voice.com. The blog has been up since May 2019, and I will continue, as I have time, to update these prophecies. But for the main time, I'm moving forward with the visuals, visual prophecies, making the videos, because they are piling up and God has a lot to say. The next prophecy that will be upcoming is the same message. All these topics that God gave me, political stuff, church stuff, court stuff, legal stuff, and child abuse at the very end of it. It's all one message. So whatever this message is titled, it will be called part one because it's all one message. And then part two will be upcoming and that is dealing with China. You can go to the Master's Voice blog. The message is already up in written form. You can read it so that you can know what to expect when the second video is made. Thank you for being with me. May God give you soft hearts. 
Ask God for a tender heart more than you ask him for money, more than you ask him for employment. This is a tough, tough economy right now. And this was already prophesied 2022. The prophecy is called wage crisis. If you simply go to the search bar and you put in wage crisis, the master's voice prophecy blog, always type that in after the titles, because I don't have the full titles to mind, but I do know the material bit. If you type in wage crisis, the master's voice prophecy blog, a prophecy will come up with a black and white photo representing a 1930, I think it's 1933 great depression. And in that prophecy I was speaking about, that's another thing that God was bringing in my heart just uh, two days ago. All these, all these layoffs, all these job losses, the inflation ever creeping up. And they're still trying to deny and say that it's a healthy job market. But this was prophesied before where God says that the economy is going to crumble and fold like a guy who's bad at playing cards. There won't be jobs. There won't be food. So that what's, what that's telling wise people in this economy is you're not still sitting at your house and saying, this is a question of the leader. We need to get rid of leader one and put leader two back in and then everything will be fixed. You're in the midst of prophetic judgment. So wise people are already drawing themselves out of that creepy insistence on looking at men to fix things. And you're now thinking like Elijah, Lord, where's my widow? Lord, where's my widow of Zarephath? I need someone to give me flour and oil. Where have you prepared this baked cake for me, Jesus? Where are you going to take me in and make sure that me and my household eat many days? Wise people went through 2020, kept their arms juice free. And many of them used to testify on those videos before I had to remove them. I did lose my employment, Celestial, but I can't exactly tell you how, but God has provided every day since. Me and my wife are not working. We couldn't find anything because of the stand that we took, but we have everything that we need and little things trickle in and they're exactly what we need because God is faithful. And then the economy opened up and then God was able to reinstate those people. There will always be attack for standing on righteousness, but then there will always be reward for standing on righteousness. And so as we see these things coming and you're still vested and we, we just need to make this great again and, and do less of build back better, then you're, you're lost. You're lost. You can't hear. And the only thing that will make you hear is, is for it to finally crumble. Because when it finally crumbles, that's when all the diehards will realize that it was God all along. And they should have been investing time in prayer and not investing time in MAGA. But that too is a lesson and the moral of the story. Until I see you again, God bless you and goodbye.